Welcome <coughs> to the third video on inverse Laplace. This video is focusing on the use of partial fractions with the cover-up rule. First a reminder of what we did in the previous video, the key steps in doing inverse Laplace. So the first step was to identify the denominator factors R subscript I of S. The second step was to write the partial fraction out in terms of the components expected. So that's what we've got here. If our original transfer function was q over p, we're going to write it as c1 over r1 plus c2 over r2 all the way up to cn over rn. And this video is focused on how do we identify the ci of s. We won't worry too much about step 3 again because that's straightforward. So how do we use the cover-up rule to do this expansion? So again, you'll see we've written down where we're trying to get to. We want to write q over p equals c1 over r1 plus c2 over r2 and so on. And the question is, given we know r1, r2 all the way up to rn, how do we find c1, c2 and so up to cn? So this slide is what we call a concept slide, okay, so that you can understand what's going on. Now what we're going to do is multiply OK, I'm going to write it out slowly so that when it comes, you'll see it much more easily. We're going to multiply by R1 of S to show you how we might get C1 of S. So here we go. I've multiplied by R1 of S, and there you can see R1's there, R1's there, R1's there, R1's there. So all I've done here is multiply every term by R1 of S. Nothing clever. And we've noted down here, in case you've forgotten, that P of S, the denominator, is simply the product of all the different R's. So it's R1 times R2 times R3 and so on. Now why is that important? Because if I look at this particular term here, which I'm doing in blue, R1 over P, you can see there's going to be a cancelling R1 factor. If I look at this term here, you can see the R1's cancel. However, they don't cancel anywhere else. So here we go. So you will have noticed that multiplying through by R1, the R1 has disappeared from this term here on the left. It's disappeared from this term here, but it still occurs in all these terms here. Now, the final note we should remind you is if you were doing simple poles, so by simple poles, I mean something like alpha over S plus a, then the numerator factor, the residue, is just a constant. So although for completeness we've written c1 of s, c2 of s, and so on, in fact, for simple poles, c1 of s is just going to be equal to c1. And that's going to make our life a lot, lot easier. So, reminder here, c1 of s is just a constant c1. And what we're going to do is evaluate what we had on the previous page at the corresponding pole S1. So there's the expression that we had, Q of S1 over R2 of S1 times R3 of S1 and so on, all the way up to Rn of S1 equals C1. And then we've got all these other terms that have still got R1 in there. Now, why is this important? Because you'll note that R1 of S1 equals 0 by definition, OK? Because S1 is the root of the factor R1. Now why is that important? Because if you look at the expressions we've got here, you'll notice there's an R1 of S1 there, there's an R1 of S1 there, and all these terms are going to become 0. So when we note that R1 of S1 equals 0, all that we get left with is this expression here. In other words, that term has gone, that term has gone, because they're all 0. And so you notice we get an explicit solution for C1. We simply substitute the value S1 into Q of S1 and then divide it by R2 of S1, R3 of S1 and so on. Now, finally, why is this called the cover-up rule? If you look at the original expression, here it is on the left, the only difference is that I've substituted in the value S1. You'll notice that this is very similar <coughs> to what we've got on the right, which is the solution for the residue C1. What's the difference? Well, the only difference 
is that this R1 of S1 has been ignored or crossed out. So it's called the cover-up rule because it's a little bit like just covering up this R1 of S1 from the original expression and evaluating what you've got left. Now, we'll do some examples, and after you've seen the examples, you'll probably think this is relatively straightforward. So here we go. Example 1, where we've got g of s equals 4 over s plus 1 times s plus 2, and we're going to write that as partial fractions a over s plus 1, s plus 2. Now first, remember what the technique is. We're going to set s equal to si, where si is a root, and that will give us the corresponding residue ci. So here we go. Step one. The first root is for the factor s plus 1. So I'm going to set s equal to minus 1, which implies that s plus 1 equals 0, and then cover up the factor s plus 1, and hence find a. So you'll see down here, you'll see how I've covered up the s plus 1 factor. And that leaves me with 4 over s plus 2. Now when I substitute in s equal minus 1, I get 4 over 1 equals 4, and therefore a equals 4. Let's try this now for the second one, factor. So here I'm going to set s equal to minus 2 because I've got a factor s plus 2. So again, if you look down here, you see I've taken the original expression and I've covered up the s plus 2, which leaves me with 4 over s plus 1. And then I substitute in s equal minus 2, and I get 4 over minus 1 equals minus 4, which gives me b. Right, example 2. We've got 5 over s plus 4 times s plus 2. So first of all, if I write this in partial fractions, I've got a over s plus 4 plus b over s plus 2. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set s equal to minus 4 and cover up the s plus 4. So that's going to give me 5 over minus 4 plus 2, that's the s plus 2 term, equals a, which equals minus 2.5. Next, I want the b, so I'm going to set s equal to minus 2, and so I've now got 5 over minus 2 plus 4, so that's the s plus 4 term, because I've ignored the s plus 2 term, equals b, which equals 2.5. So in essence, I've got g equals 2.5 over s plus 2 minus 2.5 over s plus 4. Now, you notice the box at the bottom here, which says the final step is to convert back to the time domain, so the underlying g of t here is going to be 2.5, which is a common factor, e to the minus 2t minus e to the minus 4t. Right, one more example. g of s equals 10 over s times s plus 2 times s plus 1. So again, we write it out in partial fraction form. I've got a over s plus b over s plus 2 plus c over s plus 1. So doing these in turn, I'm going to set s equal to 0, which will give me the a term. So I ignore the s term, and what I get left with is 10 over 2 times 1 equals a, which equals 5. I'm going to set s equal to minus 2, so that's for the s plus 2 term, and so what I get now is 10 over minus 2 times minus 1, so that's the s term and the s plus 1 term, equals b, which again gives me 5. And finally, s equal minus 1, and so that gives me 10 over minus 1 times 1 equals c, which equals minus 10. So what I've got, in summary, is g equals 5 over s plus 5 over s plus 2 minus 10 over s plus 1. And if I want the underlying time domain signal, it's g of t 
equals 5 minus 5 e to the minus 2t, sorry, plus 5 e to the minus 2t, minus 10 e to the minus t. Finally, just some notes before we finish. This particular video has focused on simple roots. That's roots of the form alpha over s plus a. We haven't looked at quadratic factors, which you need for complex roots. We haven't looked at repeated roots. Now, by repeated roots, I mean things of the form alpha of s over s plus a squared, or s plus a cubed, and so on. And we also haven't looked at the impact of delays. Some of these will be covered in the later videos.